This video will take a little bit of time to talk about how to evaluate some limits with algebra that involve the base E. So we'll do all four of these examples over the course of the video. I do think they kind of increase in difficulty level as we go through these. So let's go ahead and get into this. I guess the only thing to keep in mind, E is a number. It's a number that occurs enough in application and, and naturally in math that we've assigned it its own letter, E, to represent it just like we've done with pi, right? It's just a number. It's 2.7-ish. It's a number raised to a power. So let's go ahead and check out this first limit. So anytime you're evaluating a limit, you always want to go with the same initial strategy. Check what x is approaching, put it in place of the x's. So zero in this case, when you do that, uh, two times zero in this exponent is zero. E to the zero is one. One minus one is zero. E to the zero in the bottom is also one. One minus one is zero. Zero over zero is an indeterminate form. It signals that we're gonna have to do some algebra, eventually get something to cancel, and then try to reevaluate the limit. Now, for those of you that have already dealt with L'Hopital's rule, that's another alternative way to do this limit. But if you're early in your calculus course, like first month or so, this is going to be the approach that you're going to need to take for this particular type of situation. I need to do some algebra, try to get something to cancel. What sort of algebra can I do here? Now, one of the most frequently occurring ways that you can have success with getting past the zero over zero in determinate form is if you factor and cancel. And you might look at this and think, well, how in the world am I going to factor this? This numerator can be rewritten like you see I have it written across this line here. The reason why, this is multiplication in the exponent. And we multiply in an exponent when we have one power raised to another power. So if you rewrite the numerator as one minus a set of parentheses containing e to the x that ends up being squared, why is that useful? Well, in the numerator, there are two terms. They are being subtracted. This one is clearly a square. One squared is equal to one. So this one's actually also a square. That allows me to factor my numerator as a difference of squares. And if I factor my numerator as a difference of squares, I'm going to be looking at two sets of parentheses multiplied together, one involving addition, one involving subtraction. I'm putting the first thing that's being squared, which in our case is one, as the initial item inside each set of parentheses. And I'm putting the second item that's being squared, e to the x, is the second item being squared right here as the second item in each set of parentheses. Now, once you have this factored, and this is multiplication as the operation within the numerator, you can cancel shared factors between the top and bottom of your fraction. And if you cancel the one minus e to the x factor from the numerator with the entire denominator, it just leaves you with one plus e to the x. So once you get that cancellation to occur, now you want to go and reevaluate the limit. So putting zero in place of the only x that remains gives us one plus e to the zero said already, e to the zero is one, one plus one is two. Another limit involving e, uh, in this case, x is approaching infinity. Stick with the same initial step, put what x is approaching in place of the x, and then just try to reason it out. So if I put infinity in place of the x, what I end up with in this exponent is negative two over infinity. Now this is a little different situation than the last one. This is not necessarily an indeterminate form, but you are gonna have to carefully reason out what's happening with negative two over infinity. And that's where this table over on the right side of the screen comes in. If X is moving toward infinity, look at this left-hand column of the table. I've picked an X of 10,000. I've bumped it up to an X of 1 million. What happens with negative two over X? What happens with that exponent? Well, if I take negative 2 over 10,000, that fraction is very, very tiny. If I take negative 2 over 1 million, that fraction is even tinier. As x approaches infinity, negative 2 over infinity, negative 2 over x, is approaching 0. Why is that useful? Well, if this exponent is approaching 0, e to the 0 is 1. So this limit is maybe a little trickier than the initial one because it doesn't involve a line of reasoning that you maybe have used quite as often, uh, but definitely a little quicker once you realize what's happening within that exponent. Another version of a limit involved with the same function. Now we're 
considering that same e to the negative 2 over x, but we're approaching 0 and only considering 0 from the bigger side. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm putting a number slightly bigger than 0 in place of the x, and I'm thinking, all right, well, this is this is undefined, and, and that's normally an issue. I'm going to have to figure out what's going on with this exponent. So when you're dealing with limits, that's when you can try to use reasoning to determine what's happening within those locations where you have something being undefined. So I'm, I'm going to a similar strategy. I'm going to go to a table. So what's happening with x? Well, I'm supposed to let x approach 0 from the bigger side. So I have these x's getting closer and closer to 0, 1 over 100, 1 over 10,000, 1 over 1 million. As x approaches 0, what's happening with this exponent? What's happening with negative 2 over x? Well, if I put 1 over 100 here, negative 2 divided by 1 one hundredth, I can change that to multiplication by the reciprocal, and it becomes negative 2 times 100 over 1. That ends up being negative 200. Using a similar strategy, I can figure out that negative 2 divided by 1 ten thousandth is negative 20,000, and negative 2 divided by 1 one millionth, if I multiply by the reciprocal, is negative, got an extra zero in this one, that should be negative 2 million, not extra, not, not negative uh, 20 million, uh, but important point to make, this column is getting more and more and more negative. This column, what's in that exponent, as x approaches 0, that exponent is approaching negative infinity. So if I replace what's up here with negative infinity, I, I'm not quite to the end of this. I still need to reason out what's going on. Well, with a negative exponent, I know I can turn that into a positive exponent by moving to the other side of the fraction bar. So that's what I've done from this line to this line. And now I need to figure out what's going on with e to the infinity. Keep in mind, e is 2.7. If I take 2.7 and I raise it to the infinity power, that is going to be infinity. 1 divided by infinity, and this follows the logic from the table that we were looking at on the last screen. Uh, 1 divided by infinity is going to be approaching 0. I guess you can even use this column of the table. You can think of this as 1 divided by a big number, 1 divided by a bigger number, 1 divided by an even bigger number, 1 divided by infinity is approaching 0. Last limit that we'll check out here is the trickiest of the bunch for this video. We're approaching pi by 2 and we have e to the negative tangent squared of x. So here's my strategy, same strategy as we've used already. I'm going to put pi by 2 in place of the x, try to figure out what's going on. Now pi over 2, when I put it into the tangent function, if I want to use the unit circle, probably want to transition the tangent function to be expressed in terms of sine and cosine, which means it's going to be re represented as sine divided by cosine. So if I take sine of pi by 2 divided by cosine of pi by 2, what do I end up having happen? Well, the y coordinate is what tells of this location on the unit circle is what tells me my answer for sine of pi by 2. And the x coordinate is what tells me my answer for cosine of pi by 2. The y coordinate is 1. The x coordinate is 0. I end up with 1 divided by 0. So if we analyze that 1 divided by 0 in, in detail here, we have to be a little cautious because depending on which side of 0 we are on, is going to determine whether 1 divided by 0 is a really, really negative value or a, I'm pointing at the wrong one, a really, really negative value or a really, really positive value. So positive infinity or negative infinity. Now, if you think about what's happening within this exponent here, there are a couple things in addition to the 1 over 0. The 1 over 0 is, is if I follow the order of operations, I'm not going to account for the negative first. I'm going to do the exponent first. So the 1 over 0 is being squared. So regardless of if I have the positive version of that fraction or the negative version of that fraction, when I square a positive or a negative, I get a positive. So that tells me that I'm not accounting for the negative yet. This set of parentheses squared is always going to be positive infinity. If I now account for that negative out in front of the positive infinity, I have the same sequence to the end as we had in the last problem. Uh, so the negative exponent can be pushed to the bottom of the fraction, made into a positive exponent. 
2.7 ish to the infinity power is going to be infinity and one divided by infinity is zero. So if you're wondering why a handful of these limits, uh, really the final three, all ended up involving infinity. If you think about the, the graph of e to the x in general, that graph has several asymptotes. It has a horizontal asymptote and a vertical asymptote, and asymptotes are always going to involve infinity in some way, shape, or form. So that's the reason why a lot of the limits that involve e are going to involve some reasoning with infinity.